Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Michael Brandstetter, and I am a researcher for the USDA ARS Pollinating Insects Research Unit in Logan, Utah. I focus on the use of molecular data in bee systematics and conservation, and the title of my talk today is on best practices for managing native bee molecular data. The first couple of slides are to present some bigger picture ideas about molecular data in bee research. Molecular data can be used in a variety of different study types, including phylogenetics, species identification, taxonomy, and genomics. Molecular data can also be generated in different ways from sequencing single DNA barcodes to entire genomes to metagenomic data. And these data can come from single specimens, which could be fresh or from museums, from bulk samples containing many specimens or from environmental samples, such as flowers. Thinking about the goals of the native bee monitoring community, species identification and taxonomy are probably two of the most important study types, and DNA barcoding of fresh specimens will likely be one of the more common approaches. In terms of data management and deposition, it is important to consider data at different stages. There's the initial raw data output from the sequencer, there's process data, which results from cleaning and assembly of the raw data, and then there's data sets which include data for multiple specimens and generally apply to single projects or papers. This table shows each data type, some examples, and where the data could be deposited at the end of a study. My research so far mostly involves collecting molecular data from single specimens for use in phylogenetics or taxonomic studies. In these cases, the most crucial component of managing DNA data is to link the molecular data to voucher specimens. Voucher specimens are ideally the same specimens from which the molecular data were generated, or if the specimen was destroyed, they should be from the same nest series or collection event. They can also be images of the destroyed specimen, but this is less ideal. The idea is to have a physical sample that will be maintained forever in a museum and that can be examined by others in the future. Voucher specimens should have their collection data fully digitized, they should be imaged, and they should be assigned a unique specimen identifier that can be linked to other data, such as a DNA extraction code. The digi digitized information can then be uploaded into local and public databases, and the resulting molecular data can be linked to the specimen. If the physical specimen should ever be lost or damaged, um, images can then be used as the voucher. Voucher specimens and images should be deposited in major museum collections and well-supported online databases. Shown here are images of a voucher specimen of Bombus franklini. In this case, I used one leg for DNA extraction and took phone images of the specimen, its labels, and the tissue used for extraction. I also took higher quality profile and dorsal images of the voucher. This specimen is owned by and located at the Bohart Museum of Entomology at UC Davis, where it will hopefully stay forever. To repeat myself a little bit, all voucher data should be digitized and uploaded into local and eventually public databases. Important specimen data include the locality information, collection event data, host plan information, the unique specimen code, and the DNA extraction code. The extraction code itself can be a database accession number that is linked to other DNA data fields like the extraction method and date, the quantity, and the quantity and quality of the DNA. I also like to create sample names for DNA data that allow a convention, that follow a convention of genus, species, and extraction code. This name can serve as a unique code in papers and data repositories. Once a molecular study has been completed, or even while the study is ongoing, data should be uploaded to public repositories. Three of the most common public repositories for molecular, da molecular data are NCBI, BOLD, and FigShare. The first two are molecular data repositories specifically. NCBI is the National Repository for Molecular Data in the United States, and it consists of many databases. The Sequence Read Archive is used to upload raw next-generation sequencing data. GenBank, in contrast, is used for cleaned and processed nucleotide data. Nucleotide data. Individual sequences um, can be queried for identification and best matches um, using the BLAST tool. NCBI also includes a taxonomic database that provides classification information for samples. The BOLD database is the central repository for DNA barcode sequence data. BOLD stands for Barcode of Life Data System. This website focuses on barcode genes only, like cytochrome oxidase 1 for animals, and it has useful tools for species identification, species discovery, and data set analysis. BOLD can also submit sequences into GenBank automatically. Both NCBI and BOLD require that sequences come with specimen metadata and voucher information. 
but the formatting of the data differs slightly between the two. Bold also allows um, one to upload images of voucher specimens and have those linked to the data. Data repositories like Figshare are used more for final data sets um, that are associated with a publication um, or a study. These repositories can house raw or processed data, but are usually best for complete data sets, results files, and study metadata. Examples might include DNA alignments and phylogenetic trees. Um, other data repositories include uh, Dryad um, and Zenodo. Here, I zoom in on Bold because it has one of the best quality interfaces for uploading and viewing specimen data and sequences. The long image on the left shows all of the available information for one specimen barcode. Zooming in, we can see an image of the voucher specimen in a map showing where the specimen was collected. Other information includes taxonomic details and information about how the species was identified. You can also see the barcode sequence in nucleotide format and in a color-coded barcode format. So to sum up key points about managing molecular data, here are some things to sort of take home. Always link molecular data to voucher specimens or sample data if no vouchers exist. Make sure to digitize all of your voucher data and to deposit voucher specimens and DNA extracts in museum collections. It's also important to upload data into public repositories um, and at the end of the study to publish data sets um, in data repositories. And these are usually data sets that support a publication or a report. Um, there wasn't enough time to talk about everything related to, to DNA management. So here's some other sort of things to consider. Um, um, one thing would be sort of how to collect and curate species for preserving DNA, um, software for processing and organizing DNA data, backing up data before publication, updating specimen voucher information in public databases over time, and also fixing incorrect public data submitted by others. That's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Please feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions. My email is shown at the bottom left of the slide. Thank you very much. See you later.